This is continuing coverage of the trial of Karen Reed from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now, back to the courtroom. When did your father leave in relation to Brian Higgins? Um, leave? You mean like go upstairs, go to bed, or? Leave your view. Um, he would have left after Brian Higgins had gone. Mr. Albert, isn't it true that you weren't quite so sure about that when you testified on May 18th, 2023? I, I don't know. You would have to show me. Do you have a specific recollection of your father leaving after Mr. Higgins was gone? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he went upstairs after Brian Higgins left. Mr. Albert, I'd like to show you. May I approach your hand? Yes. Hmm? Right here? Okay, all right. Mr. Albert, isn't it true that you told the grand jury, I'm pretty sure Mr. Higgins left first before my dad went upstairs because he wouldn't have left if his friend was still there? Yes, I just said that here as well. Um, you don't have any specific recollection as you sit here today where your father was or where Mr. Higgins was when you looked out the window that night, No, correct? No, that's not true. I know that my father was in the room with us. I'm saying I don't know, I'm saying I don't know when Brian Higgins left the house. And when Brian Higgins left the house, then my father went upstairs into his bedroom. But what you actually said was, quote, I'm pretty sure Mr. Higgins left first before my dad went upstairs because he wouldn't have left if his friend was still there, correct? I see what you're saying, yes, but I still say that my dad wouldn't have went upstairs until Brian Higgins left the house. Right, and that's based on a, an assumption, correct? Sure, yeah. Because you weren't interviewed about this case until 18 months later, correct? Um, yeah. You did not personally observe your father go upstairs, correct? No, I did. I watched him go up the stairs. I was standing by the, I was in the kitchen. You can see the stairs right there. Your testimony is you can see individuals walk upstairs in your house? Um, depending on, kitchen? yes, the dining room, from the dining room, I meant. There's actually a, a wall that kind of blocks the dining room to the stairs. Not, not if you're sitting at the um, two chairs with your back to the windows. If I was sitting in the long chair right here, the stairs would be right here. I could easily see it's through, the, through the doorway. But as you sit here today, you don't know what time that happened, correct? No, I don't know the time, no. Mr. Albert, I'd like to direct your attention to the morning of January 29th. Sure. Can you describe sort of how you woke up that morning? Um, my dad just knocked on my door um, and I woke up and opened the door. You didn't hear any dog barking? No. You didn't see any emergency vehicles? No. Didn't hear any ambulances? No. Didn't hear any screaming outside? No. What did you do once you woke up? I went downstairs. Did you ever look out the window? Um, I don't recall if I did or not. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your grand jury testimony? Sure, sure. Thank you. Tell Mr. Lally with Paige or something. This line's 8 to 12. Thank you. 
this section. Okay. Is your recollection refreshed? Um, sure, yeah. Why did you look out the window that morning? Um, well, I say here that I um, just would give me anxiety to look out the window. Is there a reason that you didn't want to look outside? Um, I'm just an anxious person and I got overwhelmed. I think most people would be overwhelmed in that situation. Did you say that this was kind of a new thing for you, for cops and police to be at the house? Um, yeah, that's never happened before. I've never had cops at or near my house. And it made you overwhelmed, correct? Yeah, I get overwhelmed easy, so. Mr. Albert, how many times did you discuss this case with members of your family before you spoke to the Massachusetts State Police on May 18, 2023? Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how many times. Hundreds? Um, we talk about it pretty decent, I mean, considering, yeah. What members of your family have you discussed this case with? Um, my parents, my sister, um, occasionally my aunt, JJ, and Uncle Matt. Would you say it's been hundreds of conversations? Um, well, I guess, um, I guess you can, I mean, you'd have to split it up and quantify what conversations were about the actual case and what conversations have been the harassment we've faced since then. And all of these discussions took place with you and members of your family prior to your interview with the Massachusetts State Police, correct? And no, we've talked since then. You need to speak with them about this case Not since your interview. I don't know what you mean by this case. Um, this case meaning the actual case at hand or just the case about the harassment we faced? I'm talking about what happened on January 28th and January 29th. There's, yeah, but there's really nothing to talk about about those specifics, no, because we have nothing to say about that. We weren't part of it. Mr. Albert, you looked out the window multiple times on January 29th, correct? Um, twice, I think I said. You never heard any sort of commotion outside? No. You never heard screaming, yelling, or the screech of brakes in the front yard? No. You never saw a 220 pound man in dark clothes in the white snow on your front lawn. No. But you did see those tire tracks. Correct? I did. No further questions. <coughs> hey, Ms. Tavalli. No redirect, Your Honor. Sorry? No redirect. I'm all set. Hi, Mr. Albert, you're right. all set, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Your next yes, Your Honor, the call will call uh, Ms. Caitlin Albert to the stand. Just watch your step for me. Right. Step right up. Step right up. Right. You raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the evidence given to the court and jury of the case down here and should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may take the stand.
Go ahead, Mr. Lally. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Could you uh, please state your name and spell your last name? Sure. Caitlin Albert, um, C-A-I-T-L-I-N-A-L-B-E-R-T. And uh, where do you live, ma'am? I live in Easton. And how long have you lived there? About three years. With anyone do you live there with? Um, I live with Tristan Morris, my boyfriend. And uh, you and Mr. Morris, about how long have the two of you been dating? Uh, almost eight years. Now, prior to living in Easton, where was it that you lived before that? I lived in Canton. And specifically, where in Canton did you live? Um, 34 Fairview Road. And how long was it that you lived at 34 Fairview Road? Jeez, I lived there from about 2011 to 2021. And that was a, a family home, is that right? Yes. And who did you live at 34 Fairview Road with? My mom, my dad, um, and my four siblings. And your mom's name is Nicole, is that right? Yes. And your dad or your father's name is Brian Albert? Yes. And... How many siblings did you have, I'm sorry? I have four. Are you the oldest? I am. And uh, do you work for I do. What do you do for um, I work for the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office in the Medicaid Fraud Division. And how long have you been doing that? It's almost three years, I think. In September, it'll be three years. Now, ma'am, if I could excuse me, turn your attention to uh, January 28th, 2022 <coughs> to January 29th, 2022. Do you recall that time frame? I do. And do you recall what days of the week they were? Um, I actually am not sure that I recall the exact days of the week. Maybe Friday or Saturday. <coughs> Fair to say around the weekend time? Yeah, weekend, definitely. And <coughs> as far as... Your family is concerned, uh, the 29th, what if any significance is that day? Um, that would be my brother's birthday. And uh, which of your brothers was, who, which of your brothers is it whose birthday that was? Um, Brian Albert Jr. And <clears throat> is beyond Brian Albert Jr., just for sake of my own lack of confusion, is there uh, some other name uh, that you would call him as far as uh, differentiating him between your father? Um, little Brian, sometimes, even though he's not so little. Um, okay. And so during the course of, of that week, sort of leading up to the weekend, uh, what, if any, discussion did you have with your mother or anybody else in your family in regard to Little Brian's So leading up to that weekend, um, I was aware that my brother might have like a friend or two over the house um, for his birthday. And then um, I had spoken with my mom and my aunt, Julie Albert, about maybe going to a local Canton bar, grabbing some food and some drinks, um, and just kind of seeing where the night takes us, and then maybe ultimately going back and seeing my brother um, for just to say happy birthday, kind of end the night that way. As the week went along, what, if anything, sort of affected or, or changed uh, plans in reference to that? Nothing that I can really think of. Um, nothing really changed. I mean, that was sort of, I don't remember exactly how the plan came about, that we were going to, you know, go get food and that my brother was going to have friends over. But um, I believe that that was always sort of our plan. And so specifically on the 28th, um, at some point you came to camp, correct? Yes. And do you recall uh, how you came to Canton and uh, where was it that you went first? So I, I can't say for sure. I, from what I remember, I believe that um, my boyfriend Tristan and I went straight from Easton to the waterfall and actually got there before my mom and my Aunt Julie, um, from what I can remember. And then her, my mom and Julie ended up meeting <coughs> us there. And that's when we sort of started just kind of like hanging out, ordering food, some drinks. And uh, we were there for a little bit, just the four of us. And uh, do you recall about what time it was that you got to the waterfall? Unfortunately, I can't remember an exact time, but it would have been around like dinner time. So if I had to guess, maybe like six. And as far as 
drinking was concerned with that night, you were at a bar and you weren't driving, correct? Oh, yeah, no, I was not driving. And do you recall specifically what, what kind of drinks you had or what you had to drink that night? I believe that night I was drinking White Claw, I, I think. And your boyfriend, Mr. Morris, uh, as far as what, if anything, was going on with him that night as far as how long was he at the bar? Yeah, so um, we were aware that it was likely going to snow that night. So um, my boyfriend, Tristan, had gotten... Um, gotten offered to do some like plowing or shoveling. So he knew that he was going to have to probably be up for the majority of the night into the morning doing some shoveling. Um, so he didn't stick around at the waterfall for too long. I think he had some food, maybe like one or two drinks. And then he actually ended up going home. And you stayed at the waterfall after he went home. I stayed there. Yeah. With my mom and my aunt Julie. And if you recall, as far as that evening at the waterfall, what, if anything, was going on as far as, like, live entertainment? And I want to say that there might have been a band. Um, I just don't want to say for sure. But I think I do recall a band coming in and setting up. And, yeah, I, I think that there might have been one. Now, as far as as the evening progressed and went on, uh, who, if anyone else, came into the waterfall and, and sort of joined your group when you were there? Sure. So I can't say for sure, like times of people arriving or order of people arriving, but I know at one point, um, my uncle, Chris Albert, he ended up joining us. He owns a pizza shop across the street. So when, when he was done working, he came and joined us. Um, and then my aunt, Jen McCabe and her husband, Matt McCabe joined us. And then um, at some point, my father, Brian Albert, and his friend, Brian Higgins, also joined us. So at one point in time, I'm not sure the order of which, you know, everybody came in or the time that they came in, but um, at some point we were all kind of there hanging out. Now, and your father and Mr. Higgins, uh, do you know where, where they had come from or where they were coming from? Yes, I believe they were coming from New York from a funeral. And I remember I had asked my mom, like, is dad going to stop by? And she was like, I don't know. He's tired. You know, he's coming back from New York. And I was like, oh, I want to see him. So I think um, I convinced him to come. And then Brian Higgins just kind of tagged along from what I can remember. Now, as far as Mr. Higgins was concerned, is that someone that you were familiar with prior to this evening on the 28th? I knew of him and I had met him a couple times, but um, nothing more than that. As far as you're aware, the house that you, uh, for lack of a better term, grew up in or spent uh, some formative years in, um, had Mr. Higgins ever been over to that house uh, at 34 Fairview when you were there? Not that I know of. <laughs> now, at some point uh, later in the evening, um, if anyone else uh, came and, and sort of came up to your group or joined you while you were at the wall. So from what I can remember, um, I remember sitting at like a high top table and it was me and my mom sitting next to each other and we were facing like the front door of the waterfall and I recall a man and a woman walking in and at first I didn't know who either of them were um, but I noticed that the man started talking to like some of my aunts and uncles that I was with and it, he seemed friendly with the people um, that were in our group. So I had said to my mom, like, oh, who is that? And she said, oh, that's um, John O'Keefe. And I had known of him because um, I, I knew his story about his niece and his nephew and his family. So I, I had known of him, but had never met him before. Um, and so then I, and then I just assumed that the woman that was with him was his significant other, girlfriend, wife. I, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, so then, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't really speak to either of them. I, I think at one point, John came up to me and my mom and asked, like, do you guys need anything? Do you need a drink? And we said no. And that was pretty much it. And so when you say you knew of <coughs> John O'Keefe and, and sort of his story as you related. Um, do you recall how it was that you came to know anything about Mr. O'Keefe? Or who was it through that you came to know about Mr. O'Keefe? Well, in general, it was kind of like a known thing. Um, you know, 
the tragedy of what happened um, in the O'Keefe family. And so I had just kind of heard that story. And then on top of that, um, John O'Keefe's niece is either the same age or around the same age as some of my younger cousins. Um, so I, I knew that she was friendly with them. I knew that my aunt Jen McCabe would like help out here and there going to sports, going to different events, whatever. Um, I know that my aunt Jen was friendly with John O'Keefe. Um, and I knew that my aunt Julie and uncle Chris were somewhat friends with him as well. And just to be clear, when you're talking about some of your younger cousins, mm-hmm. the younger cousins you're speaking of, who were the parents? Um, so yeah, so the younger cousins that I'm referring to would be um, the McCabe girls, and their parents are Jen McCabe and Matt McCabe. And they were present at the waterfall that evening as well? Jen and Matt were, yes. Um, now, with reference to Mr. O'Keefe and, um, and his significant other that you've described, uh, had you ever met them prior to that evening? I had not, um, not to my knowledge. I wouldn't be surprised if there was maybe like a sporting event or something where we, you know, saw met each other in passing, but I, I had never formally met John or um, the woman that he was with. And so on that evening in January 28th, you had never met nor were you aware of anybody by the name of Karen? No, I was not. <clears throat> and if you know about what time was it uh, that, that they came into the waterfall and came over? I can't say for sure. I just, I'm not sure of time. But fair to say, the other people that you've testified about as far as your uncles and your aunts and things like that, were they all there at the time that Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed came in? I believe so. I believe that everyone who was there in, in the group that I was um, with was present when John O'Keefe and um, Karen Reed arrived. And about what time was it um, that things started to wind down as far as the waterfall was concerned? Again, I'm, I'm the worst with times, but I would say it was around like 12-ish that we kind of said, you know, let's kind of head out um, and head home. I would say 12-ish, approximately. Now, um, during the course of the time that you were at uh, the waterfall, either before or after uh, Mr. O'Keefe and, and Ms. Reed arrived, <laughs> How would you describe sort of the, the mood or, or the demeanor of the group that you were with? I mean, I, I didn't notice any issues or any negative things happening. All the conversations seemed positive, lighthearted. Um, everyone was just kind of having a good time, getting along. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, really. So, so no issues as far as fighting or tension between your group, is that correct? Correct. And as far as you saw, as with regards to Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, no issues as far as fighting or, or tension that you observed between the two of them? Not that I observed, no. And when you, uh, around 12-ish or so, when you started to, uh, to leave, who was it that, uh, how did you come to leave and, and who did you leave with? So I left with my mom and my dad. Um, and again, I'm not sure the order of when like everybody else left. Um, but I, um, I went with my mom and my dad back to 34 Fairview Road. And if you recall, who, uh, who drove home from the waterfall to 34 Fairview? My dad. And about how long a drive is that from, from the waterfall to, to Fairview Road? I would say like five or six minutes, give or take. And when you arrived uh, to the house at 34 Fairview, um, do you recall where your, where your father parked in relation to the house? From what I can remember, he parked in the driveway. Um, I, yeah, the driveway. And if you know about how many other cars were, were in the driveway and were in the park? I'm not sure. I know there was at least like one or two, um, but I can't say for sure. I just don't really remember how many were, were in the driveway at the time. I, I had like younger siblings in college at the time who would sometimes take some of the cars, so I, I just don't remember for sure. And if you know, essentially, they're within uh, the driveway, there's a garage at the end of the driveway, is that correct? Yes. And there's a uh, door on the left, door on the right, is that right? Yes. And do you recall whether or not your father pulled in the driveway on the left side or the right side in relation to those doors? I don't remember. And when you came into the house, do you remember how it was that you came from the vehicle to the house? 
Yes. Um, from from what I remember, I went in the front door. So I would have gotten out and walked um, on the brick path uh, over to the front door area, walked up the steps, and then walked through the door that is enters into like a foyer area. And just to be clear, sort of when you walk into that front door with the foyer area, what if anything's right in front? Um, so... So when I first walked in, I actually had seen my cousin Colin. Um, he was standing in the foyer area. Um, and I remember I said to him, like, oh, hi, what are you doing? Next question. Not what you said to me. <laughs> Taking you back to sort of when you're exiting the waterfall and when you're exiting your parents' vehicle and walking into the house, what, if anything, did you observe as far as the, the weather at that point? Um, I remember at that point, snow was definitely coming down, um, and I could tell that it was like progressively getting worse. And so you walk into the home in the front foyer area, that's where you run into your, your cousin Colin? Yes. How is Colin related to you as far as, how is he your cousin? So Colin is um, Julie Albert and Chris Albert's son. So he's my first cousin. And um, when you walk in, um, you sort of bump into him. Where, where was it that he was? He told me that he was headed. Not what he told you. Where was he going? Um, to my knowledge, he was going home. Objection. Oh, well, next, next question. Next question. From the time that you walked in and bumped into Colin sort of in the foyer of the home, um, how long was it that he was in the home while you were there? I would say. No, how long was he in the home while you were there? Minutes. And from your group, this includes yourself, your mother, your father, is that correct? Sorry, what was that? From your group, when you enter the home, that includes you, your mother, and your father. Correct? Yes. And um, who, if anyone else from the waterfall, arrived at your home around the same time as yourself, your mother, and your father? I believe that Brian Higgins was the next to arrive. I think he very shortly after came inside, um, after my, myself my mom and dad. And so when Mr. Higgins comes into your, the house of 34 Fairview, are you already in the house? I was already inside, yes. And so do you have any idea what Mr. Higgins was driving that evening or where he parked it? I do not. And then once you come into the house, uh, at some, well, when you come into the house, where is it within the home that you go? So I, I walked in through the foyer and then um, I took a right turn, which leads into like the dining room area. Um, and that's where my brother Brian and two of his friends were just sitting around the dining room table. Um, so I said happy birthday to him and was just kind of hanging out in there for a little bit. And the friends that you observed in that sort of kitchen dining area, uh, the friends of your brother Brian, a uh, little bit, mm -hmm. um, what were their names? Um, Sarah Levinson and Julie Nagel. And were those people that you were familiar with prior to this evening in January 28th? Yes. Familiar with them as their, their friends of your little brother? Yes, exactly. And with regard to um, with regard to the house, after yourself, your mother and your father arrived, and then Mr. Higgins after that, who, if anyone else, from the waterfall came to the house that you saw? My Aunt Jen and my Uncle Matt McCabe. And when your Aunt Jen and your Uncle Matt McCabe uh, arrived, uh, where was Colin? Colin had left by then. Objection. I'm going to allow it. And when Mr. and Mrs. or your, your uncle and your Aunt McCabe uh, come in, where is it that they go with them? Um, I believe they, they did a, a similar thing. They either entered through the dining room or through the kitchen area, but the dining room and the kitchen are like open floor, kind of all the same room. Um, so we were just all kind of hanging out in that area. And uh, if you know about how, how long a period of time were you at your parents' house at, on Fairview Road that is? I would say an hour 45 latest, like t latest two hours, but um, around like an hour and a half, an hour 45. But yeah, I can't say for sure. It's an estimate. And for the balance of the time that you were there, were you in that same sort of kitchen dining room area? Yes. And what is it that you were doing as far as you and the group doing in, in that area of the house? We were just kind of hanging out. Um, I remember that my mom had grabbed like a small speaker and put some music on. 
Um, we had a couple drinks and everyone was just kind of like having a good time, hanging out. Um, we said happy birthday to Brian and that was kind of it. And in Salvador, um, at any point in time when you were um, within, well, let me ask you this first. As far as the uh, sort of demeanor or mood uh, within the house, similar to how I would ask you with the waterfall, did any of that change once you returned back to your parents' house at Fairview Road? No. Um, so everyone getting along, no arguments, no tension, anything you observe? Ex correct, yeah. Now, beyond uh, the people that you just described, uh, did anyone else uh, come into your house, or into your parents' house that evening while you were there? No. And uh, specifically, Mr. O'Keefe uh, and or his, his significant other, Ms. Reed, uh, at any point in time while you were there, did they come into your house? No, neither of them ever came into the home. Now, with regard to the people that you were describing before, um, at any point in time, uh, did the people in the kitchen, dining room area, any of them leave that area of the house? I think when we, f when my mom, my dad, and I first got there, I believe my dad went upstairs to grab the dog to let her out. Um, so, so yeah, so he did that. And then I think there was another period of time where my dad might have been showing, or maybe my mom or my dad were, were showing Brian Higgins, like family photos, photos of one of my brothers, um, who's in the Marines. So I, and that would have been in like the family room area, which still is like, there's an open doorway. So it's not like the door was shut or anything. Um, but other than that, we all kind of stayed within that dining room kitchen vicinity. Now with reference, uh, to the dog, that was a family dog. Is that right? Yes. And your family had the dog when you still lived at on Fairview Road with your parents. Yes. And what was the dog's name? Chloe. And with respect to letting the dog out, uh, can you describe to the jury sort of what that process entailed? Was it on a leash or, or how would the dog be let? Sure. So we had like a fenced in backyard and we had a back door. So we would just kind of open the back door, let her out. She would kind of do her thing and then she would come back in when she was done. And uh, your father took care of that when they got home from the waterfall that evening? Yes. In the family room that you were talking about where your father and or your mother and Mr. Higgins were as far as the photographs, where is that in relation to the dining kitchen, um, dining room kitchen area? And specifically, can you see into that area from the dining room kitchen? Into the family room? Yes. Yes. So there's just sort of like a... It's like a doorway, but there's no door there. It's pretty open. And if you're standing in the dining room or the kitchen, you can see into the family room for the most part. Now, you at that point were not living at the address on Fairview Road. Is that right? Correct. And uh, as far as the people that were at the house who did not live at the Fairview home that, um, on that night, who was the last person? I was the last person to leave. And prior to your departure from the house, uh, sometime hour 45 or so after you got there, mm -hmm. um, can you describe the order in which the other people that you just described were there? Uh, what order did those be? I don't remember the order in which um, everybody left, but I do remember that Sarah Levinson, Julie Nagel, my aunt Jen, and my uncle Matt they all left in one car and then Brian Higgins left. Um, but I, I just don't remember the order in which it was probably within like a couple minutes of each other, but I just don't remember, remember exactly who left first. Um, and then I left pretty shortly after everyone else as well. Now, during the time that you were, um, hanging out in that, um, dining room, kitchen area of the home, um, at any point in time, did you was your attention drawn to the outside of the house? Did you hear anything, see anything outside the house? I did not. And uh, with respect to the front area of the house, uh, at any point in time, was there any discussion that you recall about anything going on in that area? I don't recall a discussion going on about anything happening out front, except for at one point, I. No, let me hear her answer first. 
except for what, at one point? At one point, I um, remember that Julie Nagel's brother was supposed to pick her up. Um, so I, I knew that there was some communication where she told him, never mind, um, you don't need to pick me up. Um, you can go home. I'm going to go home with uh, Jen and Matt. Now, <clears throat> with respect to your aunt, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer McKay, um, what, if anything, do you recall um, her doing with, uh, do you recall her having a cell phone that night? I do. And what, if anything, do you recall her doing with respect to that cell phone? I remember at one point we were standing in the kitchen and I had noticed she was on the phone. Um, and I, I remember she said something to the effect of like, oh. No, not what she said. <laughs> okay. So next question. Um, at some point, did you see her talking on the phone? I did. Okay, and at some point, did you see her appear to be texting on the phone? I'm not sure about texting. I definitely saw her speaking with somebody on the phone, though. And at some point, uh, where did she put her phone in, in relation to where you guys were in the kitchen and dining room? I'm not sure. <clears throat> Do you recall any sort of uh, charger or anything like that in that area of the home? I don't. Now, as far as... Um, who picked you up from the house that night? My boyfriend. And uh, Mr. Morris came to the house in Fairview Road and picked you up at some point, about an hour, 45 minutes or so after um, you arrived there. Is that correct? Yes. And <clears throat> I recall what Mr. Morris was uh, driving on that particular evening? Um, I remember that he actually was driving my car, um, which is a 2019 white Jeep Cherokee. And uh, what kind of car did Mr. Morris have at that time, if you recall? At that time, he had a very old, I want to say like 2012 Ford Taurus. So that's why he took my car, because the, the Taurus wouldn't have been good in the snow. And um, how was it that you came? Did he call you, text you? How did you know that he was there? I believe that we texted. Um, and... That's how I was informed that he was out front. <clears throat> so you receive a text, something to the effect of here, and then you go outside? Yes. And when you went outside, uh, if you recall, um, what was the weather like when you were coming out of that? When I walked outside, I remember, again, the snow was coming down um, a lot. I remember like sort of trying to watch my step because the stairs in the brick path were pretty snowy um, and I didn't want to slip. So as far as weather, yeah, I remember it was actively snowing and I was trying not to slip. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I can remember. And do you recall where it was that your boyfriend, Mr. Morris, parked the car in relation to the house when he arrived? I believe he parked in the driveway. Uh, so you would have come down the steps, down the walkway to the driveway area, correct? Yes. And who drove from Fairview Road to back to back home that evening? Um, Tristan did. Now, um, if you recall, um, when Ms. Morris, I'm assuming, backs out of the driveway, is that correct? Mm -hmm. When he backs out of the driveway, um, where does the vehicle go in relation to the house? We went up Fairview Road, so towards the flagpole um, in, our, in our yard. And so towards the flagpole with the passenger side facing the house, is that right? Yes. And if you recall, as Mr. Morris is driving away from the home, what, if anything, uh, with respect to the weather, um, did he have to employ within the car? I remember the windshield wipers were on, um, and I remember he was driving very cautiously, 10 and 2. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, it, the snow is coming down pretty hard. And as you drove past the house, were you looking outside or looking at the house or the front lawn area of the home? I was not. Once I got inside the car, I was mainly, my attention was on him. Um, and we were having a conversation. So I, I hadn't been looking out um, the passenger window towards my house at, at really any point. So your head was turned towards your boyfriend who's driving the car to the left of you as he's driving away from the home? Yes.
I have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Unetti? Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. So, Ms. Albert, you were at your parents' home on January 29th by midnight or shortly thereafter, correct? Correct. And you were the last one to leave at the uh, 145, 2 o'clock, somewhere in that area? Yes. On January 29th of 2022, after you got up that day, uh, did you receive a call, a text, any sort of communication from any investigator connected with this case? I did not. Trooper Proctor did not contact you on January 29th? No. He did not interview you on January 29th? He did not. What about January 30th? He, no. 31st? Nope. How about the entire month of February? Did you hear from Trooper Proctor wherein he set up a meeting or an interview with you? I did not. Um, then what about the entire rest of 2022? Uh, Objection, Your Honor. Proctor interviewed you during that entire year? All right, so the objection's overruled. You can answer that. Okay. Um, I was not interviewed, no. No. Uh, and then in 2023, prior to May of 2023, uh, were you contacted by Trooper Proctor or any investigator for an interview regarding what you just testified to here today? I don't think so. Uh, and you hadn't met Mr. Lally by May of 2023 either, correct? I don't think so. But in May of 2023, you actually were test called to testify at another hearing um, where neither the Commonwealth or the defense in this case was present, correct? Correct. Mr. Lally and Ms. McLaughlin were not there, and certainly no members of the defense team were there, correct? Correct. And May of 2023 was uh, well over a year after the events that you were called to testify about, correct? Correct. Right? So if, if these events happened on January 28th and 29th, 2022, January of the end of January of 2023 would have been a year and now you're being asked for the first time to give testimony about what happened back in January of 2022 in May of 2023, correct? Yes. And then it was only after you testified before that other proceeding without the prosecution and the defense of this case there that Trooper Proctor finally interviewed you in August of 2023, correct? That's correct. And that was four months after you testified in that other hearing of May of 2023, correct? June, July, uh, I'm sorry, three months. June, July, August, correct? Correct. And it was about a year and a half after January 29th of 2022, correct? I believe so. All right. Now, on direct examination, Mr. Lally had asked you about whether you knew uh, Brian Higgins. Do you, remind, do you remember that line of questioning? I do. And I believe you testified that you knew of Higgins, correct? Yes. Uh, and you thought that you had met him a couple of times, correct? Yes. So, Brian Higgins, you would classify as an acquaintance, correct? To me? Yes. Um, I would classify him as a friend of my father's, not really an acquaintance or friend of mine. 
Okay. So he, he didn't rise to the level of an acquaintance, somebody who you, you met, but you didn't really know. I'm, I'm not really sure how I would categorize my relationship with him. Again, it was just more of like, he was my father's friend. If I had seen him walking down the street, I would have said hello to him. Um, I don't know anything about his personal life. I don't like communicate with him regularly. So I, I mean, if that's what you would consider an acquaintance, then yes. I guess I would ask, but what do you consider an acquaintance? How would you define that term? I would say an acquaintance is someone who you are friendly with um, and might see from time to time. I guess in my head, I'm just sort of thinking someone who's in closer in age with me. I, I usually think of it as more of like a friend type thing and not my father's friend to me. I, I guess that's just the way I think of it in my head. Okay, so is your testimony before this jury that an acquaintance is really a friend? Someone that you're friendly with, perhaps. Could be. Okay. Uh, have you watched any of the testimony in this case prior to your taking the stand today? I have not. Have, has anybody told you anything about any of the testimony that has occurred prior to your taking the stand today? No. Okay. Who is Katie McLaughlin? Um, Katie McLaughlin is a girl who I'm in the same, I'm the same age as, um, we went to high school together. We graduated the same year and we have, um, a couple mutual friends. We interact with some of the same people socially. I don't really, I, I can't think of a time possibly ever where her and I, ever hung out one-on-one -on -one or individually. Um, so more of like a, a friend of a mutual friend. Okay. So, uh, Kate, you would not consider Katie McLaughlin to be a friend. She's not a close personal friend of mine. I asked you if she was a close personal friend. Objection. Just let her finish her answer. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your answer. I would not consider her one of my, again, close friends. Okay, all right, so let's get back to my question. Um, would you consider her to be a friend? Objection. I'll allow that. You want to make we approach? Okay, Doris, feel free to stand up and stretch. Ms. Albert, you know Courtney Proctor, correct? I know of her, yes. And you've, you've been in her company several times, correct? Yes. You've met her children, correct? Once, yes. And you know she is Michael Proctor's sister, correct? Yes. Uh, when Michael Proctor ultimately interviewed you in August of 2023, um, did he ever ask you how well you knew uh, his sister, uh, Courtney Proctor? Did that subject ever come up? Not that I remember. And did you ever mention it to him that uh, you, know, you had met his sister and met his sister's kids? I didn't, I did not. Now, on January 28th of 2022, uh, you went to the waterfall with your boyfriend, Tristan Morris, correct? Yes. And ultimately, he left and you stayed, correct? Yes. The reason that you stayed is you wanted to go back to 34 Fairview, your old home, to be there by midnight when your brother was turning 23, correct? Not necessarily. I... I, my plan was always to stay and um, just spend some time with my mom and my aunt. Um, but Tristan left very early because he knew that he was going to have to be up at 3 o'clock in the morning shoveling or plowing. Um, so I, my plan was never to go back with him. Um, but it wasn't necessarily because it was my brother's birthday. It was just what my plan was for the night. 
Uh, certainly the fact that it was your brother's birthday didn't deter you from going back there, right? In other words, the fact that it was your brother's birthday didn't cause you to hesitate to go back. You wanted to be there, right? Well, my brother Brian wasn't at the waterfall. Um, no, I'm, I'm talking about... My, let me, let's start over. <laughs> Tristan left, right? Yes. You stayed at the waterfall. Yes. And you planned to go back to 34 Fairview, did you not? At some point in time, that was spoken about. And I agreed to go back to 34 Fairview, yes. Okay. And you went back there to see your family, correct? Yes. Including your brother Brian, whose birthday it was, correct? Yes. That was your parents' home, right? Yes. You grew up there? Yes. You were comfortable there? Yes. There was plenty of room at the house, correct? In what sense? A bunch of bedrooms? Yes. Not all of them were taken up, correct? At that time, correct. Uh, you certainly felt welcome there, correct? Yes. Uh, and there was no problem with you staying there overnight, correct? Correct. Uh, and when you made the decision to go there after the waterfall, you knew that there was a snowstorm that was starting, correct? Yes. And you've already testified that when you went back to 34 Fairview, you, you uh, saw your cousin Colin Albert inside the home, correct? Yes. Uh, in fact, you walked in and he was one of the first people that you saw, correct? Correct. Uh, he's been over your house many times, correct? Correct. You're close with him as your first cousin, are you not? I am. And your brother Brian Jr. is close with him as well, correct? Yes. Colin Albert is close with your parents, correct? Yes. He's certainly welcome at your parents' home, correct? Correct. And it was certainly not shocking to see your first cousin, Colin Albert, at your home, correct? Correct. And you had a brief interaction with him, correct? Yes. That was sort of toward the foyer of the house? Yes. And then you continued deeper into your parents' home and you saw other people there, correct? Yes. Where did you go within the home after you had seen Colin? I believe I entered through the foyer into the dining room area. And when you were there, you saw your brother Brian, whose birthday it was, correct? Yes. He had two friends with him, Julie Nagel and Sarah Levinson, in that same area? Yes. You greeted them as well? Yes. And that's where your attention was focused, fair to say? I would say that once I said hello to them, um, I didn't just sit with them three, I sort of was walking around. Um, I wouldn't say my attention was solely focused on them three, but I did greet them, yes. Uh, and where you were walking around within the kitchen dining room area? Yes. And uh, once you greeted Colin and left him, uh, it's fair to say that you then were not looking over your shoulder monitoring what Colin was doing or where he was going, correct? Correct. And while you were in the kitchen dining room area, the door to the basement was kind of blocked from your view, was it not? If I'm in the dining room area, um, there is a spot in there where I could see it, but I don't believe I... I could see the basement door now. Right. And from your vantage point, um, the door to the basement's kind of blocked from the area that you were in. For the most part, yes. And you weren't watching Colin to see where he went after you left him, correct? Correct. And you never saw him leave the house physically, correct? Correct. Maybe a good time to pause. I don't know. If, are we going past four? All right. That, that, we'll, we'll pause then. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Ms. Albert, we'll bring you back tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask you to stay here and just let the germs file out okay. first and then you can follow them. All right. Thank you. Same three Bye, questions. Please do not discuss this case with anyone. Don't do any independent research or investigation into this case. 
If you happen to see, hear, or read anything about this case, please disregard it and let us know. Tomorrow's a half day. We'll see you in the morning. All rise to the court, please. Sure, call me this way. Follow them out. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's good. All right, so Miss Dianetti, why don't you tell me now what it is you hope to do tomorrow and the basis for it? Right, so uh, my plan, Your Honor, is it is based on the fact that uh, Katie McLaughlin, when she testified, uh, tried to minimize her relationship with the uh, with Caitlin Calvert. Uh, the reason why that's relevant is that we have proof that she has changed her story after she learned that 34 Fairview was the Albert family home. Uh, she was on record uh, with uh, Trooper Proctor stating that, uh, this is Katie McLaughlin, stating that what she heard my client say, she actually overheard. She heard my client addressing Jennifer McCabe on scene in a hysterical manner saying, uh, allegedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Uh, and that evolved uh, in this case to a uh, multi-part conversation with many different people, including starting with Katie McLaughlin saying, was there any trauma? And she and my client supposedly responded, I hit him. And then a police officer jumps in and asks another question, and my client supposedly said, I hit him. And there were like four different times where my client was responding to others so that it wasn't really this burst of excitement and an excited utterance. Uh, she tried to cast it as uh, statements that were, were made upon reflection, making them sound more ominous and more inculpatory than uh, what they were, particularly because the person to whom my client was speaking, who was no friend of my client, uh, reported that she said, did I hit him, could I hit him? So we have a, a clear conflict in the testimony. We have a witness who has admitted that her statement has evolved, uh, and she's admitted that it, her statement evolved after she learned the identity of the house that she was at, which happens to be the house that Caitlin Albert grew up in. When she was confronted uh, with, uh, the, you know, who is Caitlin Albert, when Mr. Jackson asked uh, Katie McLaughlin who Caitlin Albert was, there was a long pause, and then she was very, ins and then even the way she phrased it was, I think, telling. Uh, I went to school with somebody by that name, or it was something to that effect, which just sounded ridiculous. It sounded like it was somebody that she was trying to remember. Uh, you know, at that point, we had four photos that we marked for ID, H, I, J, and K, uh, where we have them together. We have them being Facebook friends. We have a, a, a nature of the relationship that she tried to conceal in our view. Since that time, we've been deluged by other uh, photos of the two of them together, including one, you know, intimate photo of them, uh, you know, the, the four of them, I'm uh, sorry, when I say the four of them, I mean, Kate, uh, Caitlin Albert, her two college roommates, and the only person who's not a college roommate in that photo is, is uh, Katie McLaughlin. Katie McLaughlin also said that she uh, never went on anything other than occasional day trips with Caitlin Albert. We now know that that's false. We have them uh, in, together in a hot tub drinking in a photo that is from Maine, uh, which is about a four-hour drive away. Uh, when is when is that? that? Was, uh, the, it was posted on, in 2016, which is another. But when did it when did it occur? Did it occur in 2016, or was it posted in 2016? It, it was posted in 2016. I think the answer is that's when it, when it, uh, it was it was a new photo that was uploaded. I mean, it's a moment.
Um, the, uh, that location was tagged on 2016, so we know it was after uh, high school, which again contradicts Katie McLaughlin's testimony because she made it seem like this was just some girl that I knew in high school and then we happened to be at the same places at various times, but I'm not close with her despite the fact that I have my arm around her in most of the photos. The other uh, aspect of this, Your Honor, is that she said that she had not, Katie McLaughlin testified she had not seen Caitlin Albert for, uh, I think, two or three years prior to uh, January of 2022, uh, we have a baby shower photo that is from June of 2021. They are standing next to each other. Do you have someone to authenticate that date? Caitlin Albert will authenticate that date. Authenticate that date. Uh, why, why are you because sure of that? Going to, well, she's going to be showing a baby shower which occurred in 2021. Okay. That's when it's timestamped on, on social media. If, and Caitlin Albert, her face and her body are in that photo. Katie McLaughlin's face and body are in that photo. They How many other people are in that photo? I think there are, I, I, I think there are six. I have the photo look. Give it back to Mr. McDermott. Who wants for ID? Oh, thank you. Or actually, if I can just see those, I, I thought these were different photos. If I could have those, then, then you don't need to count the people. Uh, there are five other people in the photo with them, uh, but they're together on the right side of the photo. Uh, I mean, you know, these photos impeach the testimony of Katie McLaughlin multiple times, uh, and uh, we should be allowed to explore the bias of these witnesses, particularly the bias of Katie McLaughlin, who purports to give incriminating testimony against my client brand new testimony that only existed after she learned of the identity of the homeowners in this case. This is classic bias and classic impeachment evidence. There is no reason why we shouldn't be able to show photographic evidence of this relationship, much like Mr. Lally's shown photographic evidence of the 34th Fairview, what it looks like. It's intended to assist the jury. Uh, and in doing a 403 balancing test, Your Honor, uh, the, the probative nature of, of this evidence greatly outweighs any prejudice. She's able to explain these photos any way she wants when Mr. Lowden does his redirect uh, examination of her. But uh, with, without being able to get into this, Your Honor, uh, Hayley McLaughlin's testimony, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's like she's wearing a, a suit of armor. We can't get through it. We have, we have the, the tools and the evidence to get through it. We have the ability to expose her as somebody that's misrepresented something very important to this court. But if we can't ask these questions and we can't get in these photos, then we're not able to do it. All right, Mr. Lally, what do you say? Your Honor, just as far as the authenticity of whatever these is, um, as far as social media is concerned, there's a variety of ways to fabricate that. And I think it's interesting that Mr. Giannetti is really vague about <clears throat> where these photos came from or how he knows uh, the specifics that he's so sure about, about when they occurred, where they occurred, what state people were in, what day it was, who is college roommates of who within these photographs, um, but has no specifics about you know where these deluge of, uh, of photographs came from. More importantly, Your Honor, what I would submit as far as Ms. McLaughlin is concerned is she was entirely consistent, and I, I did the disparagement as, as far as uh, what her testimony has been, as far as her statement within the report to Trooper Proctor, her grand jury testimony in this case, and her testimony before this jury on the stand were identical if not entirely consistent. And again, it's not just Ms. McLaughlin that is attributing this statement to the defendant. The jury has heard from two other firefighters, uh, as well as uh, anticipated other witnesses who will testify to these exact same statements that the defendant made outside of the home on that date. What counsel I think is referring to as far as the could I have hit him is something that the defendant said to Ms. McCabe, which was overheard by Ms. Roberts on a speakerphone on the way to Fairview Road. And then she modifies that statement when she's asked specifically about the bruising and how that could have been caused. And it's at that point where she repeats, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Uh, so to then use 
prior statements to a completely separate witness that have nothing to do with Ms. McLaughlin to try to use that to claim impeachment or bias is ridiculous. And then as far as it applies to this specific witness, when it comes to impeachment and bias, what the case law is very clear about is if it goes to bias of the witness who is on the stand, and the witness in this case is Ms. Albert, not Ms. McLaughlin. All right, thank you. This will save us some time tomorrow. All right. Well, the, the only other thing I was going to add, Your Honor, is those, Mr. Lally's arguments go to the weight, not the admissibility. But I, I pulled up my notes, which I'm sure the court has. Uh, she has morphed her statement into, I asked if there had been any significant trauma. She said, I hit him. Then she repeated it. A woman said, you're hysterical. You need to calm down. She said, I hit him. Then a police officer said, what did you say? She repeated, I hit him. Uh, and, you know, Ms. McCabe herself testified in the grand jury, that's not what happened, that she said at that moment, did I hit him, could I hit him? She's on record saying it. All right, thank you. I'll take a look at my notes, and we'll figure this out first thing in the morning. Good. All rise. More raw courtroom coverage of the trial of Karen Reed is coming up from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Press subscribe so you don't miss a minute.